at this point, we've got a pretty good sense of the image formation process. Um, and now what we're going to really start doing is digging in to understanding images. And I'm going to go ahead and just warn you uh, that the next few sections are going to be mathematically and notationally heavy. Um, we have to prepare ourselves for this. There's certain notation and mathematics we have to get through. Um, there's two things you need to do coming out of all of this. We're going to do convolution, we're going to do Fourier, and we're going to do sampling theory. And that is understand the high-level concepts, conceptually what is going on, and then, of course, understanding the details so that you can actually implement everything. Don't get too bogged down in the details in the beginning. Um, make sure you understand the concepts, and then the details will come over time as you start to do exercises and projects and exercise those ideas. Now, fundamental to the image formation process is that we are going from a continuous time signal. I'm going to do everything in 1D again, the way we've been doing, and eventually go to 2D. We're going from a continuous signal, light out in the physical world, to a sampled signal. It's discrete. Right? So think light out here in the physical world. You're, you are looking at a discreetly sampled version of me where every pixel corresponds to a sample taken from that continuous light um, waveform. Now, in images, it's pretty similar. I have a continuous, I can't actually show you a continuous light field here, so I have to show you sort of a cartoon version of that. So I have light out in the physical world, and this is a discretized version of it where I've sampled um, at very particular moments in space and time, of course, to create a digital image. And that process is really important in understanding images, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit of detail. So let's first start talking about discrete signals. And again, we're going to play the same game that we did earlier on. We're going to do everything in a lower dimension where graphically and notationally it's a little bit easier, and then we'll eventually lift up in dimension and talk about full-blown images. So let's first start talking about a discreetly sampled signal. Okay? And a couple of words on notation. So I could have done this with any of different things, but I've chosen to use square brackets to denote a sampled signal or image. And eventually, we'll do round brackets to denote its continuous counterpart. So along the horizontal axis here are, think about these as pixel or um, the locations that we've sampled. So uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, up to 12. And then this is the corresponding value. So if it helps you, imagine taking a single digital image and grabbing a single scan line and just plotting the values. So where it's dark, the value is low. Where it's bright, the value is high. That's basically what we're working with. Or this could be an audio signal where I'm um, sampling the sound um, out in the world. For our purposes, it's not going to matter. What matters is we have a discreetly sampled signal. So how do I represent that? Here's one representation. It's graphical. I'm just plotting using this little stem plot the value at each moment in, in space. Now, I can also represent it numerically. So in the way I'm going to do that, and this is going to seem like a really fussy notation, but there's a very good reason for it. So I'm going to denote my signal f of x um, as the set of values. You see the curly brackets here, f sub 1, f sub 2, up to f sub 12. There's a little confusion in the in notation. I just want to go ahead and note it. So I'm referring to the value of the signal at space position 1 as f sub 1. And then the next one is f sub 2, and so on and so forth. But I'm also referring to the entire signal as f sub x. And it'll be clear which one I'm using when. Am I referring to a single sample, f sub 1, um, f sub some value, or am I referring to the entire signal, f sub x? Okay. And that, of course, if I go back to this graph over here, is just the value 0, 1, 2, 4, 8, 7, so on and so forth. So you can think about the signal graphically. You can think about it numerically. I'm simply enumerating all the values in the 1D plot. By the way, and the image is going to be exactly the same. I'm just going to have rows and columns associated with all the, the pixel values. Now, we're going, to be, we're going to want to use this very special signal, um, discrete time signal, um, called the unit impulse. So let me go ahead and define this, and it'll be ob obvious in a minute why this is an important signal. So this signal is denoted as delta of x, discrete time signal. Um, also has that square bracket that you see there telling me that it's a discretely sampled signal. And it has the property that it is defined so that it is one 
when x is zero, so at the origin right there, and it is zero everywhere. So in some ways, it's the simplest possible signal you can imagine. It's got a single unit value at the origin and zero everywhere else um, from left to right. And here, by the way, I put the origin at the middle, but where that is is sort of irrelevant. Whether I'm centered at zero or zeros on the left doesn't really matter. Now, why is this an interesting signal? So I'm going to do something that seems really trivial, but it's going to turn out to lead to a really beautiful formulation. So let me take the representation that I just described to you, which is f of x is a series of values strung out together. So 0, 1, 2, 4, 8, 7, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and let me represent that instead of just enumerating a bunch of values in terms of the unit impulse. So let's see what that's going to look like. I'm going to take my f of x, that's the signal that I showed you earlier on, there it again, that square bracket, and I'm going to write it as a sum from k equals minus infinity to infinity of f sub k, there's that notational trick that I was telling you about, this now refers to the kth value, not the entire signal as I'm doing here, so just pick the kth value, uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, etc., and multiply it by delta of x minus k. Okay, first of all, what's going on here? This seems, I mean, I have a perfectly fine representation of a signal. I've got a simple delta function. Why am I doing this? We'll see in a minute. I'll suspend disbelief for a minute. So what's happening here is I'm going to say that this signal can be written as a sum of scaled versions of the unit impulse. Okay? So what does that mean? Well, let's go ahead and look at that. So first of all, what is delta of x minus k? Well, Delta of x, we've agreed, is just that. Unit impulse at the origin, zero everywhere else. Delta of x minus 1 is this, where when x is 1, we have our unit impulse and zero everywhere else. Delta of x minus 2 is this, where the value is 2, we have the unit impulse and zero everywhere else. And what am I saying? I'm saying my original signal is equal to scaled versions of these three signals. By how much? Well, whatever I want the value of the signal to be. 0 times this plus 1 times this plus 2 times this. And if I add those up, because there's only an impulse in each location, I'll start to construct my signal, which seems really dumb. It seems really like this just seems like the ultimate overkill here um, to represent a signal like this. But again, there's going to turn out to be a very good reason to do that. We are representing a signal as a sum of scaled and shifted unit impulses. Okay, so why am I doing that? Here we go. Now, we have discrete time signals. That's a, a scan line of an image. Um, it's uh, the, um, the temperature at each moment in time we are sampling. It is a sound wave, whatever it is. And often we want to do something to that signal or that image. We want to process it. We want to analyze it. We're going to push it through some computer vision system. And we're going to talk about those. In particular, we're going to talk about discrete time systems. And what a discrete time system does is it takes as input a discrete time signal, f of x. Here's my discrete time signal uh, system, rather, t. And it outputs another discrete time signal. Okay, so it transforms in some way the signal, or the image. We've actually already seen a couple of these. Uh, changing the brightness, changing the contrast, gamma correction, sigmoid, histogram equalization are discrete time systems. They take as input something that's discrete, an image. They do something to them, and they output another discrete time signal or image in that case. So we've already seen this concept, but now we're going to formalize it. Okay. Now, I haven't talked about the delta function yet, but here it's going to come in a little bit. Okay. So what we're going to do now, let's just talk about a very simple example of a discrete time system just to get you some intuition. So here's my discrete time signal again, f of x, x, here's my signal, I'm going from left to right. And here's a very simple discrete time system. What I'm going to do, there's my g of x, that's my output um, over here. And what I'm going to do is take, it looks like a running average of the signal. So why is it a running average? Well, let's see. I'm taking 1 over 2n plus 1, the sum from k equals minus n to n. So let's imagine n is 2, let's say. So that means I've got 1 over 5 here. There's going to be five samples, 2 to the left, 2 to the right, plus the center one. So it's the sum from k equals minus n to n of f of x plus k. 
So I go two to the left, one to the left, and then I take f sub k, uh, f sub x rather, when k is zero, and then to the right, to the right, plus one, plus two. So one way to think about that is right here. What I'm going to do is, if I want to know my value of g at, say, five, then I plug in five back over here, and what do I do? I take the sum of these five numbers, and then I divide by five. I take a running average. Simple enough discrete time system. It takes as input one discrete time signal and returns another discrete time signal. And I've just shown you one of the values, but I repeat this over and over again for each value of g, sliding things over, taking a running sum. So here's the next one. If I want to know g of 6, well, I go back up to here. I take the sum from 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. I divide by a 5, and I've got a running average of the two. Okay? So now, I haven't really brought in that delta function yet. I just told you that I can represent my signal as a sum of scaled and shifted delta functions. I've also told you that we have discrete time systems. And you know what's coming next is we're going to put those two pieces together. So at this point, what's important to, to remember is we have discrete time signals, which are sampled signals from some continuous signal, sound, light, whatever it is. We're going to represent those, although we don't really know why just yet, as a sum of scaled and shifted delta functions, where the delta function has a value of 1 at the origin and 0 everywhere else. And we've also defined discrete time systems as something that takes as input a discrete time signal and outputs a discrete time signal. And now what we're going to do is keep moving forward with this and try to make sure that we understand various types of discrete time signal processing, and then eventually discrete time image processing comes next.